and here we are for the final segment for today i think i can just control s save this mm, doesn't seem like it but uh, it's probably auto saved already so next steps on the inner project then uh, i think there's probably going to be a bit less uh, progress than i would have liked to as i used far more time and energy into the demonstration that i than i expected let's do something so we've got the bones the bones can be blue they don't have to be black although black um might be uh, would be a good one I'm going to get the favorites and the hard pencil once again. So let's start throwing in some bones. We are going to stack up the opacity. I'm going to have the shoulder joints, a bit like this. So the one arm is rotated a bit towards the front and the other one is very slightly rotated towards the back now oh, hello pig uh, just in time for the inner project i spent more than an hour than an hour, an hour uh, drawing a barrel so i'm a bit uh, more exhausted than i would like to be but we will get something done today so the clavicles are going to index somewhere around here. Uh, who's the subject? This is uh, is the old, good old uh, inner postcard. The clavicles uh, do not really move from the sternum. So when this arm has been brought forward, it is going to lift. The clavicle so it ends up something like this. The one that's pulled back, on, on the other hand, is going to be more or less flat. So, the next thing is, of course, so we want to have our skeleton, um, our midsection come back to about here. And the sternum is about half of that. So we want our sternum to be around here. And we want, you know, a, a narrow arch for the, uh, for the rib cage. That is, um, is typical for women in general and particularly for, um, oh, more for people with, um not thick torso we are going to have uh, a bit of schematicity here mm, the neck hole is going to be something like this for neck attachment the skeleton of course does not have a neck hole and there is going to be the face to the chest, roughly like this. And then, of course, there is some volume. This is quite easy for me to draw now that I have already completed the, uh, the volume matrix. We are going to have the spine going around here. And then moving forward. The colors are a bit mixed up with each other. We are going to have slight rotation here. So that means that the line between the wings, wing tips of the hip bone. It's going to be slightly angled away from the um, from the angle of the chest here. Uh, 
I think the point here is supposed to be the end of the uh, tailbone. So we are going to have um, the spine comes down here. It curves, uh, has a bit of a recurve here. And there's the sacrum. It's going to be around here. And of course the hip bone comes out of um, out of the sacrum, then dips down here. Get the pubic bone here. I'm going to it's going to be uh, centered in the middle. So I'm adding in some uh, you know help, helping lines here. Then you have your. There's a bit of a spike uh, on the back side of the, the hip bone that all of the um, muscles of the um, behind the rear side of the upper upper leg attach to. And then it turns uh, curves a bit up again to meet up with this um, the front part of the hip bone with all the with the holes in it. This part is not going to be particularly visible for us, but of course, I'm going to try to mark it here since I am going to be drawing in, um, or at least sketching in the muscles that attach to it. So, we have our hip bone. The attachments of the upper leg, uh, upper leg bones. Are here we've got this um, a bit of a protrusion here that ends up looking like this that is going to be slightly in this direction and slightly in this direction except that it is going to be rotated a bit because the entire leg is rotated a little bit so more like this. And once again, since I spent uh, a couple of hours yesterday thinking about all of this, it's going to be uh, comparatively extremely easy for me to draw the skeleton today. So then on the other side, we are going to have a um, bit of a rounded head to the bone. This side we are going to have a bit of a, a knob here and then really in between is not exactly um, straight but it's it's close enough I usually just throw it as a straight straight shot so then we are going to have the the knob is going to be on a bit on the other side and here we are going to be then rotate it So a bounding box and then the the head of the bone is going to come up around something like this and then again just a relatively straight shot from the hip to the head. Next up this is going to be slightly angled again uh, as compared to the um, upper leg bone because the the leg is angled slightly bent at this point i am going to add in a uh, a bottom most layer that has slightly lower opacity so that i can Add these doodles without um, 
And on this side, we are going to have uh, this is the way that the um, the knee works is that you have the lower leg bone and it can rotate along a sort of a track here so that in the extreme well really in the extreme case it's going to be uh, along here so it, it moves glides along this curve on the head of the upper leg bone And in this case, we are going to want it something like this here. So it's the angle is almost, as I remember from trying it out yesterday, the angle is going to be almost um, almost 90 degrees. This curves and becomes the inner ankle bone. And you are going to have an extra bone on the other side there. That's going to be the outside ankle bone. And then over here. Going to be something like this. And again, it is going to rotate, twist around so that it becomes the inner ankle bone. And there is another one here that makes a relatively straight shot to become the outer ankle bone. So, at this point, I'm not going to make uh, massive changes to um, how I sketched in the in the foot yesterday. I'm just going to more or less uh, trace it for this layer. This is the outside, so it is going to rise up a little bit. This is going to be the start of the toes, so starting from the toes, there's a bit of a um, box for the volume, looks fine to me, and then on this side, I'm going to have something very similar, On this, in this case, we have the higher side is um, on the other side, so on our side of the camera. This is already a kind of a contour line here. We have the toe box here. And it has to get slightly larger because it is again closer to the camera than, um, than the foot itself. And then we get the bones of the upper body. The upper arm bone, again, is uh, fairly similar to the um, upper leg bone. You've got this. Uh, you don't have the you know protrusion, but the attachment is slightly offset, so it's more like this. And then you have your knob here and the knob is once again has this sort of uh, brace track form to it and the uh, forearm bones move along here in very much the same way that the, the knee functions we are going to want use this one make a bit of a bounding box here and then something like this a 
And then our attachment is here. And uh, once again, it's not actually a straight shot, but I don't think um, I'm not familiar enough with all the knobs here to actually draw it perfectly. And I'm not convinced that drawing in the knobs um, is actually all that helpful. If you were to draw in all the knobs, of course, um, your draw, uh, drawing would look very good. Uh, and if you are drawing like, you know, living skeletons, skeleton monsters for a, a fantasy scenario or something, uh, you probably should consider uh, doing it like that. But, uh, you know, just for... Uh, as a helping as a method to help you do a good job drawing um a living human no, it's it's not helpful the knobs are largely places where things attach so from that point of view drawing in the knobs would make it easier for you to um see where the muscles will attach i think that it's too much effort for that purpose. So if you want to remember where the muscles attach, I think it's easier to just memorize where the muscles attach rather than memorize exactly what the knobs on, um, on the skeleton are like. So next step, we have the forearm bones here. And you have um, two of them. They are kind of similar to the um, lower leg bones again. So you have your knob here, the rest up, and you have a more robust bone in the middle. So this is sort of similar to the curvy bendy bone on the um, on the lower leg. This one is curvy as well. But I can never quite remember how it curves, so I usually end it end up drawing it more or less straight. And then you have the outside. There's the other bone. And this is the case in the um, in the arm as well. In the case of the um, arm. It is this bone that rotates. So when you turn your wrist, uh, it's this um, this bone moving, and the more robust bone that attaches actually to wraps around this here, the knob here. Uh, that one doesn't rotate; it just uh, you know turns over here. How exactly uh, rotating your foot works, I don't know. There is a certain amount of movement there, but if it if it works with the same principle that it's it's only the outer bone that rotates, uh, I don't know. I might have learned that at some point, but uh, have forgotten it since. So here we have kind of a ninety degree angle. So we are going to have our nobly bone. Wrapping around here a bit, and then it is going to end up on the inside of the wrist. And I think the the curve is going to be something like this. So it's not the curve isn't particularly functional. You will, you know, looking at um, the, for example, the gap. That you get when you cross your arms is not actually a muscle separation it's it's the place uh is the gap between these muscles or the contour of one of these uh, of this the gap between these bones and proximally probably the contour of one of these bones and the other bone is on the outside and it is there is no real rotation here so it's just going to shoot up towards the towards the rest here and you might uh, want to notice that the the rotating bone is more robust at the wrist than the non-rotating one
I think it uh, it makes it easier to remember how to draw things. It's probably not very you know art relevant as such. And the same on this side, we are going to have the nobly bone on the inside, the blocky bone on the outside, and the nobly bone is again going to be around the middle here. It's going to make a curve roughly like this. In this case, we will be more or less able to see the large bone. It is more straight. I think it's going to be hidden behind the knobbly bone that's a lot more robust here, at least partially. The reason that I always call this knobbly bone and the uh, the other bone is because I can never remember which from the radius and ulna is which. And I assume that for the people listening, most of them aren't going to be, you know, uh, anatomy experts either. So describing them rather than using their, you know, Latin names is probably going to be more useful than doing it the other way around. Now then, we get into the wrists. There is a huge amount of wrist bones. But uh, luckily, throwing the wrist bones is not actually all that useful or helpful, so you don't have to remember all of them. You can just throw in a sort of, uh, you know, half, half of a hockey puck. And that's going to communicate the volume of the bones very well. Again, if you are drawing some sort of fantasy scenario with living skeletons, this is not going to be particularly helpful, but uh, if you want to do that, then you are going to have to actually look up a uh, an entire skeleton model somewhere. I don't know if fantasy artists um, draw their entire skeletons from memory or what, but uh, I'm not capable of drawing a perfect skeleton from memory. So at this point, I am drawing in the palm bones. So these are the uh, first finger bones, but they are all hidden inside the palm of the hand, so you cannot see them. You might see uh, parts of them on the, uh, on the outside, so the back side of your hand, if you are extremely lean, but mostly, mostly not. The thumb also starts around here. I am going to draw that in on this side. I think on the other side it is not going to be visible in the slightest. Yeah, no. It starts here as well. It's a bit shorter, so it's going to be somewhere around here. So we can maybe add, add a tiny speck of purple here. But. Uh, Really, the thumb of the stage, stage left, no stage right, um, person, the left hand of the character, which is stage right, is not going to be all that useful. There are. So starting uh, at the palm here, you have the palm bones, and then you have three sections forward of that, and all of those together are the same length as the palm bones. Roughly speaking, of course, the hand has a sort of a you know, form like this. They are not; it's not uh, a square, but as a, as a rule of thumb. And inside there. The first ones, and um, the next two also have roughly the same length. And then this one here and this one here are also about the same length. So as a rule of thumb, you can just have the entire hand is uh, the length of one, you know, skull ball, 
I need when you start halving it, when you half it one time, you have the palm here, and then you have the fingers here. When you half it another time, you have the first knuckles. So if you are drawing a fist, you are going to when you make a fist, the palm bones of course do not move. So everything up to here is uh, is fast. Then you rotate this one halfway and half it. So the first knuckles are going to be here, and the rest is going to rotate again like this and then half again and rotate like this so there's a kind of a schematic way to draw a you know closed fist of course a closed fist doesn't end up being a cube like this they wrap around all sorts of uh, you know other parts of the hand but uh, i think you you get the, you get the point and it's going to be somewhat helpful to think of things in, in this way. Actually, I think I have made um, a bit of a mistake here. Since she is grabbing on to her hat, the thumb, of course, will have to be rotated. It's not off to the side, it's, it's on the under, underside here. So it, it is, in fact, not going to be visible at all. Same on this side. Thumb is not going to be on that side, it is going to be on the underside. And it is not going to be visible at all. This is of course quite nice, since um, this is a high effort project in any case. So I don't really want to have extra things to draw. And I think a lot of these fingers are going to be visible either once we get uh, get around to it. So next up we have uh, have the skull. I think I'm going to take a new layer for the skull and maybe you know, lightly lightly erase uh, around the neck here so that it, you know maybe uh, I'm going to move that to this layer so that I can it's not strongly visible in any case, and that I can remove it from this layer entirely. So that I have some more space to be working on the on the head here. The head is quite uh, well formed since yesterday. Do I actually have something that I want to draw in here? Uh... Let's just start start tracing this. There's the um, orbital bone, and then the backside of the of the head is uh, composed of two component components. If you look at my uh, self portrait here in the corner, you will notice that uh, the orbital bone is far too. Um, prominent as I think I have explained uh, even in the past the problem there is that I originally wanted to um, have a black and white you know, uh, pencil, pencil portrait style but uh, ended up pivoting away from that but unfortunately neglected to actually um Change the change the aesthetics. There's the cheekbone there. Some teeth. I'm just going to do this like a cartoon skeleton way of um, marking in the in the teeth here then you have the mandible um, stereotypically you want to have if you want to have a macho character you have these you know extending mandibles uh, I've got a bit of that uh, if you go to a museum of archaeology and look at people from the past they generally did the men did have uh, larger jaws because a lot of people use their jaw as a tool, so as sort of a third hand. 
leather workers would bite down on the leather that they were working on and bones grow when there is stress on them so leather workers ended up having this sort of huge uh, Schwarzenegger looking jawlines however when when we are drawing delicate women we would like to have them rotate uh, them turning the mandible turning slightly in here so as i have drawn here of course we have the teeth line on the underside as well and we end up with something like this or an uh, an inner skull And I think at this point, uh, this is a good point to uh, think about where, you know, extra um, elements of a character come in. So if you had like um, cat ears or fox ears or something like that, you would like to mark where they sit on the head. In this case, we are going to have uh, some flaps. So it seems that the way that I had originally drawn the um, brim of the hat, the flaps would not actually be visible unless they were extremely long, which they are not. So it is a good idea, good thing that I thought about this a bit now. So this is roughly where the flaps are going to be. This one is probably slightly to the forward and this one is uh, probably slightly up um there isn't really much of um you know character design reason for that i just think it uh, sort of fits fits the uh, fits the wind the you know setting yeah the composition I, I have a you know instinctive feeling that the composition is going to look nice if i um Put the flaps like this i guess it's a kind of um you know counter line to the uh to the curve there so there's some you know dynamic um dynamic movement and at this point I am going to sketch in the shoulder blades here. They are not going to really have an effect on this drawing, but I'm going to sort of sketch them in. A lot of muscles attached to them, so they're not really something that you can completely ignore, even if, if they are not going to be exactly visible in, uh, in the final drawing. So, there we have our bones we can jack down the opacity on the sketch and a bit on the bones and then we can start throwing in some muscles i'm going to use a, a blue color for this so what do we want to start with i think the uh, muscles of the back are largely going to be absent from this I could, you know, add in some uh, a bit of the neck. It's going to go go about like this. So here we are. And it, um, bit. No, let's let's actually keep it quite dark. Hmm. No, let's. Uh, Let's start with the midsection. We have the pectorals, the breast muscles. These attach up to about two thirds down the collarbone here, and they attach about one sixth down the way from the really, you know, below the head of the of the bone here. They basically have. Two major components one of them is you know more just straight here 
not particularly visible in this pose, but for example, um, bodybuilders will often. Yeah, I think that is actually going to. Go more like this, so it's it's going to be slightly more visible than I initially drew it as. In any case, this is something that's very prominent on bodybuilders and very prominent in some poses, but uh, not really this one. And then you have the the large parts. We're going to the gate. Give this one some volume as well. Of course, we do not want to draw. In her as a bodybuilder, that she is not. But we want to have some volume because there is some volume uh, on the bones. And there's a bit of a fat pad here, as Ina is extremely um, slim. There is going to be very little fat there, but there is some. And uh, importantly, for particularly drawing more. Um, Female characters with larger breasts, the uh, breasts do attach to the pectoral muscles. So doing a good job drawing it is going to make later stages of the drawing process easier. That is... Make this a bit more aggressive here. That's uh, looking fine to me. Then you have the abdominal muscles. Uh, the group starts right here at the sternum, but the part where they actually become more or less visible starts here. And uh, the curve follows the curve of the um, of the trunk here. So for you know, very uh, muscular individuals, you will be able to see some definition here. This will not be the case for, for Ina. The, this group attaches to the pubic bone and it attaches to the wingtips of the um, of the hip bone. So when you have Center, center line is going to be something like this. It's actually, in this case, since she is... Um, is rotated a bit. The center line is going to be turned in a little bit because she is sitting in a way that actually... compresses the belly a little bit. Really, it should be attaching to the inside, not the outside of the wingtip here. So that is looking all right to me now. Um, when doing character design, so you have this, you have the chest, and you have the hips. If you have a broad chest and narrow hips no big big flared chest here uh, the abs are going to end up having this sort of um, widening structure probably every bodybuilder that you look up is going to look like this um, some I, I remember Arnold Schwarzenegger looking exactly like this. Probably all of the uh, other ones look as well. If, however, you have a white, uh, a thin chest and white hips, so let's think of, uh, you know, an extreme um, pear-shaped woman. They would have abs that. Um, that are uh, thicker at the much thicker at the bottom than at the top and of course if you have a bit of both 
say for me for example i have very flared uh a very flared chest but also um relatively wide hip the abs end up looking like a block so if you're doing character design um you might want to use one of these you know for male characters and uh, one of these for female characters depending a bit on what sort of you know uh aesthetic you're going for you sometimes see people drawing muscular women looking like this this is not a question of how much muscle that you have this is a question of what your skeleton looks like so of course it's possible for women to look like that as well but it's not a requirement being muscular does not make you look like that having a specific form to your skeleton makes you look like that so getting back here i am going to add this bend here to the other sections as well so that i don't remember i don't forget it later and then add some uh, contour lines the belly button is going to be around here it is around the the middle here the middle of the gap so here we have some control lines to the, the abdominals then you have a muscle that uh, attaches to the wing of the hip here and to the bottom of the rib cage you end up with something like this and it attaches to the side of the abdominals and let's say in in mildly uh, let's say slim but not quite in you know bodybuilder uh demaciated individuals you can probably see this border before you can see any real definition in the abs themselves so that can be quite a useful thing to uh, keep in mind if you are drawing you know relatively uh, lean individuals after that this is a bit of the back muscles here uh, there's a large muscle that comes up uh, along the lower back and wraps around under the armpit this is not going to be uh, that one attaches here as well so it it might barely be visible at the at the end here but that uh, organizes itself indexes into this sort of um, the side muscles which uh, probably are not going to be particularly uh, prominent in a character like enough so we can just you know keep them like this I'm going to switch colors to red for uh, the parts of the back muscles that are going to be relevant. And there's the very large um, trapezius muscles. They attach to the base of the skull here and just behind the um, just behind the shoulder. So when you have this, like a thick neck bodybuilder and they have this glob here and then the shoulder uh, this is what we are talking about of course on inner it is not going to be massively pronounced but it is going to be there and it will be separate from the um, actual neck muscles here which attach at the uh, at the clavicles here and there is going to be another group of them as well that comes out something like this and of course on the other side she is going to have a bit of that as well there is a bit of a gap between here so when you shrug your shoulders you can see that there's a, there's a hole that there's not really anything in and that is the case uh, behind that gap you have the uh, large back muscles and in front of the gap you have your um, collarbones and then the upper parts of the breast muscles
other than that, I don't think any of the back muscles are going to come to play here. So let's move on into the leg muscles. What do we have here? We have the ass muscles, of course. Again. Um, really the entire, entire length of the wing of the of the hip bone and up or actually in this case down where is it now here, here it is down to the uh, tip of the tailbone is where the ass muscles attach this is going to be a bit of a difficult pose for it but these attach themselves um down around one third of the way uh, down the leg. There's a couple of more, you know, detail muscles uh, to the uh, as group, the head of the uh, thigh bone here attaches up here, and there's uh, a muscle that does not attach to bone; it attaches to, on top of other muscles. Uh, the muscles in question are going to be the thigh muscles. Uh, a nice one to draw for some contour. And then there is uh, the adductors attached relatively wide, uh, far down here. So this ends up being a sort of a, you know, triangular curtain muscle. This is something that... Uh, is very prominent on the uh, on the human legs. So once we get around to you know tips and tricks for people who want to start drawing, uh, keep these in mind. Other than this, you can basically draw the upper legs as as cylinders, but this uh, adds a, a lot of detail to your work immediately. On the other side, we are going to have a bit of a similar thing here. And from the wingtip to somewhere around here. I think the rest of the ass muscle is not really going to come into play here. It's going to be hidden, mostly hidden behind the, uh, the leg muscles. And as for the leg muscles, we start with the with the knob here again. We have a couple of muscles that go well, towards the end here. Going in some some contour here. And the one on the outside is a bit shorter. And then you have uh, a further one. How exactly does it go again? I have to been a while since I've, I've drawn an entire musculature. I'm going to have to think about this. You've got here, you've got here, you've got something that comes over, over and here, and I think it starts um, around the middle of the wingtip here. It probably goes in the middle. That's going to obscure a lot of this thing, uh, these things as well. So from here to here. But from here to here and here to here. Seems all right. Ah, on the back, legs of the back of the um, legs going to the muscle of the back of the legs going to come into question here. We start here, and they 
and they end here so actually probably on this side at least for a little bit and i think on this side yeah slightly slightly as well so you end up with this sort of a multiple curve here the leg eventually stabilizes at a sort of uh, sort of a cylinder outlined with So, then moving down into the lower legs, we've got a bit of a curtain muscle again. You can just you know, fill in the gaps. But then, in addition to that, you have a larger, sort of a banana shape, shaped curve, a banana curve muscle on the outside here. Um, a little nice, nice gentle curve. And of course, the same on the on the other side. Something like this. And then, in addition to that, you are going to have a. Have a bit of a curtain muscle here, and then you are going to have the sort of banana muscle, and then you have some large knobs on the on the back side. This is a really ends up looking like this if you have uh, if it's extremely differentiated, but I don't think it's going to be around the top third of the leg. So you are going to have a symmetrical extra mass around the back third of the leg but it's it's mostly going to be visible on this this leg or the other one it's going to be relatively obscured behind here you've got a bit of a an asymmetry uh, aesthetically here so that's uh looking fine to me then we have the uh, arm muscles again we got uh Head wraps on, on both sides, front and back. I'm going to use the same color separation, you know, red for things that are on the back here. It might come in handy, but not necessarily. I think the on this side, it's it's going to be entirely un, uh, invisible. Then back to the front, we are going to have um, the head rope muscle attaches to the knobbly bone here. You can tell because when you flex your um, biceps and turn your wrist, that the biceps move and the head rope muscle is under there. You generally can't see it unless uh, you're looking at the bodybuilder. And since the other one moves, it obviously attaches to. Since the bicep moves, it obviously attaches to the bone that moves. The biceps has uh, sort of a, a double structure here, two heads. That's why it's called uh, biceps, two heads in Latin. Uh, a lot of anatomy vocabulary is uh, self explanatory if you speak Latin. But unfortunately, it's not if you do not speak Latin. And I think a large part of the audience is not going to speak Latin. And there's some, you know, slim, elegant inner biceps. They attach uh, at the head here, and one head attaches to the collarbone here. I'm going to draw them combining around here. And after that, they attach to this muscle here. 
So we are going to have something like this here. And what do we have on the other side? Did I mix up? No, I did not mix up. Uh, we have the triceps, so three heads. In this case, it's going to be the shoulder blade and the head. There's one attachment here, there's one attachment here. There's a blob here, there's a blob here. And in this case, the teardrop muscle down here is actually part of the same group. So I, from an artist's point of view, I conceptualize the teardrop muscles as a pair. But anatomically, the teardrop on the backside of the arm is actually a part of the triceps. So, the side that attaches outside attaches at the head here. And again, it's, it's variable for me. It attaches around the halfway point here. So I'm going to use the same for inner. This is not going to be visible. It's irrelevant. The other one attaches at the... Uh, shoulder blade. This one is going to be much more relevant. You actually do see it from this angle. After that, you get into the teardrop muscle, so you have this sort of, you know, if if slim enough, you have this sort of droop, uh, you know, curve and then uh, break curve on the back, on the lower side of the arm. Of course, if there's enough fat there, it's just going to droop down. Mm -hmm. It's going to start over there and it is going to come in something like this. So this is going to be the final volume of the of the upper arm. Seems fine. Then let's get back to the. Okay, I'm going to start new groups, new uh, layers for this because this is going to um, overlap a bit with the with the upper arm. Now we are going to do the classic uh, inside to the inside, outside to the outside, outside. So we have our the inside is uh, the inside of the elbow is here and the inside of the wrist is over there so this group attaches to that group and you are going to end up with some mass along here and then we are going to do the same on the other side inside inside and with some mass you don't want to don't want to uh, go hog wild here it's easy to get um, much too large muscles uh, for the character design so Ina is of course slim I want to pay attention to not giving her huge massive bulging muscles and then we have the outside to outside so here the outside of the elbow is back there and the outside of the wrist is here there is actually very little uh, actual rotation going on this is a fairly, fairly fairly neutral pose then we have the outside to outside on this side again there's uh, the muscles wrap around a little but there's not you know, braille rotation going on here. Very simple stuff. And then we have the extra muscle group. So this one comes out of the outside, so it's going to be difficult to see. But it comes out of between the biceps and the head drop muscle here. That is going to be somewhere here. I think it's barely going to be visible on, on this side. And it attaches itself to the uh, to the thumb. 
So this is extremely prominent in some angles and poses, but in this case, it's um, I think it's going to be almost irrelevant visually. On the other side, it's going to be entirely irrelevant since it's it, it just runs behind here. It's going to have uh, absolutely no effect. So what we are still missing is um, some meat on the hands, uh, the shoulders. I'm going to move on onto the shoulders now. There are three parts, the shoulder muscle. The shoulder muscle itself attaches relatively uh, down here. It's one third of the way, so it's uh, clearly already in the... No. Muscle. The uh, the long bone area. It's no, it is no longer the... Um, the head where the uh, breast muscle attaches. That's a bad contrast. I'm going to have to use something like a very dark purple. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. It attaches around here and it attaches at the halfway point of the collarbone. And in this position, it, this uh, muscle is going to be lifted. This is the forward part of the uh, shoulder muscle. So it's going to be relatively prominent. Then there's also a middle part. That is going to be visible as well. And there is a, uh, a back part that is not really going to be visible from this angle. I'm going to have to zoom out a little bit. I might have... No, I think it's 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 the right size. I was worried about uh, maybe having made it uh, much larger than it should be. But uh, I don't think so. It looks fine. So it's going to end up looking something like this. Seems fine to me. What kind of meat do we have on the uh, hands here? This is a red layer. I'm going to use red again. Uh, the largest amount of muscle that you actually have on the, on the hand is behind and in front of the uh, thumb. So none of that is going to be visible here. Apart from that, you are going to have some fat pads, the karate chop fat pad on this side. And then I think the rest of it is again not going to be visible. You have a fat pad in front of the fingers here that uh, gives the attachment of the fingers this kind of slope. That is because of this you know, fat here. The muscles, the, the bones are, are relatively straight, but you have some fat here. You have some fat at the karate chop area here. And then you have the muscles of the of the thumb. I'm going to doodle them a little bit. So I've been doing, uh, I've been talking a lot about anatomy in any case. So might as well. So there's... Um, one on the outside, this is actually something that I'm going to need to do some, you know, perspective, you know, volume drawing for. So this is the outside. There's um, a small amount of kind of like a curtain muscle here, which pulls the thumb uh, away. And there's a large blob of muscle on the palm, palm side that, uh, you know, Pulls the, mus uh, pulls the thumb in the other direction. And that's uh, basically all the meat in the hands. There's a lot of tendons and things like that, but uh, I don't think those are necessary or interesting to draw unless you are, again, talking about bodybuilders or very old people who have extremely bony hands. Yeah. I'm not familiar enough with those uh, topics to actually do a good, good job um, talking about it. So I'm going to move on into the muscles of the head. So what kind of muscles do we have here? Uh, mostly it's not really all that relevant. You've got like a, a sphincter around the mouth. 
which of course um, is the muscle that turns the uh, mouth into an O, occursive. And then you have some muscles around here. Let's also pull on the um, on the lips. These are very important for facial features, but uh, it's probably going to be easier to find a reference of the facial feature that you want to draw than thinking through, uh, through which muscles are moving. I sometimes do it like that. Like you, you might not see me drawing uh, arrows. It's going to, like for example, I would draw an arrow like this uh, to signify that this muscle is is pulling. For example, if you were, were smirking or having an extreme smile. Uh, that might happen. There's a bit of a gap here, and then there's some muscle on the un underside of the mouth again. So you can't really pull the corners of your mouth in that direction, since there's little to no muscle actually there. And then, of course, you have these kind of, you know, curtain muscle things uh, around the head that you can use to use, move your move your ears, that you can use to move your your furrow, your brows. There's a lot of uh, small muscles in the head that are extremely important for things that we want to draw, but uh, not necessarily helpful. So, question. Uh, when it comes to constructing muscles, the liberty is to draw anime faces. Um, if I'm going to just, you know, throw an anime face as anime face, I'm probably just going to wing it. So I might have a... Uh, actually, let's use the skull for this so I don't have to throw anything new. Turn that off. Pull this out a bit. Turn down the opacity here. And turn down the opacity of the bones a bit. Uh, I pretty much always draw the, um, you know, kind of a schematic skull, so that I I like to draw the uh, volume of the nose. But if I am thinking about drawing like an anime nose, I I don't detail it in any in any way. I just pick out you know some area to take as the you know, the point of the nose, the shadow, uh, the extreme uh, angle of the most most extreme angle of the nose. Uh, when it comes to eyes, the natural problem of the anime eye is that it is often much too large to actually fit within the cavity of the skull. So instead of the eyeball being about this size, you have the visible part. So instead of the eyeball being about this size and the visible eye being a, a, a section of that, you have the visible eye being the size of um, the actual skull, uh, the actual um, eyeball, and the eyeball would have to be maybe not that large, but something something like this. That's uh, not something that I am particularly good at. I often uh, end up with sort of uh, you know French comics influence where the uh, aesthetic is stylized, but not as extreme as the stereotypical anime face. So I would start with having the, uh, you know, the skull cavity, the, the eye cavity, the actual size of it. But then instead of um, what I might do if I was uh, making a, you know, a big effort, not, you know, adding in the, uh, getting to the underside of the um, size that's possible. Instead of, you know, add the, starting to add the eyelids at a scale like this, I would instead use this, this entire volume to, um, as the edges of the, of the eye itself. So the bonus to using this kind of method is that you keep uh, a relatively good volume to the um, volume and, and face to the eye.
So you might end up with something that uh, looks like this. And you have the, the nose here. Uh, I like to... So in this case, if you were to draw the uh, eyebrows where they actually go, so here, overlapping, it's probably not going to look uh, the way that you want it to look. So you might actually, you might use the guidelines for the um, up, upper side of the brow ridge as the you know, location of the, of the eyebrows. And then, of course, with the, with the mouth here, Generally, the mouth is um, the width of, of you know, the middle midpoints of the eyes. Works for this as well, since the eye, eye sockets have been turned into the eyes. But of course, you generally don't want any volume to the lips. So instead of showing something like... Um, Something like this, and then starting to work work your way up. You you might want to do that so that you end up with something that um, resembles the the anime look, but in the you know inking phase, you might want to take a much uh, smaller part of it uh, forward. And when it comes to the outline, you know. Just not actually follow the contours like usually there's when you think about it most parts of the of the face are going to have uh, some sort of a representation in this you know stereotypical anime face but they will be somewhat you know bizarrely um, proportioned or they, they might be uh, radically simplified like the uh, contour of the face here. If I was drawing this as something a bit more detailed, I would of course have more detail here, but when you draw in more detail, it often ends up uh, looking older. Which is of course, when you are drawing your waifus, that's not something that you want to have happen. And then finally, you might uh, want to increase the size of the cranium a bit, makes it, um, it makes it cuter. Do something like this. And then you'd have some sort of, you know, there, here. Let's uh, raise a bit. You don't have this, like a baby, baby skull here. And instead have a sort of a, you know, hairstyle. What do I want to turn off here? I want to turn off the muscles and the bones and the sketch and the helping lines. So here we see that the um, the mouth did not end up uh, looking very anime at all. So this is something that you would have to do in a different way. Um, so probably constructing constructing the mouth is going to be uh, counterproductive for your anime uh, drawing pleasure how to do it then how do how do you construct it when you when it appears that you actually don't um don't want to construct it um you might take the bo a bounding box of the teeth and use that as a sort of um you know bounding box for the face and then just Draw in in there. Uh, seems fine to me. Uh, you probably don't want, you know, the corners of the mouths being represented either. You just want, and I think you probably want your line relatively high up on the face, higher up than it, uh, you know, actually has any place being. I think that's uh, that's probably going to be my recommendations for this uh, for this question what do I want uh, muscles I think this is going to be what I want here 
probably uh you know if you want to make a full effort like if you want to practice drawing at the same time that you are drawing your waifus you might want to take a copy of the uh, base of the face and draw in the muscles and try to make a more realistic drawing of it and then keep that off to the side and then try to exaggerate and caricaturize and take it as a sort of um you know caricature drawing uh, exercise so uh i think that's going to be pretty much it for the for the muscles here that's uh, looking pretty good to me i'm going to add uh, another layer now we are going to get into another you know waifu topic with drawing the breast so the do i have it the opacity yeah, i have the opacity jacked down that's why i can't see anything here so turn the opacity up again the opacity of the bones can be a bit stronger or two, I think. So you have attachments um, here along the, let's say, middle of the sternum, and then one third of the way up the up the breast muscles. So you end up. Um, you could draw, you know, like a like a helping line from the. Actually, I'm going to rope this up again. If I'm going to start messing with it, I can might as well uh, use use a helping line uh, layer from the from the front here where the collarbones attach to the tip of the um of the breast muscle here, and then you can start, you know turning this into a teardrop depending on you know what the size is that you want to do like if you if you want it to make it large you might want to sketch in a kind of a kind of a ball here and then start working with that but uh, that's not something that we want to do today we want it uh, actually quite small here enough volume that there's going to be interaction with the with the sundress later but not a lot so then actually i'm going to add a uh, a bit of a you know white out layer under here not that big, not that small. White out some of the um, some of the muscle down here, so that I can more easily uh, draw on top of it without messing anything up. So you basically have this structure here where the uh, breast muscle comes uh, down from below the shoulder muscle and then it separates into the outline of the breast here i think the curve here is a bit too aggressive it's going to look tropey which is not something that we necessarily want of course um, breasts will droop under um, under gravity so you will want to have some amount of hand to it and especially if the person is um, lying on her back for example you will want them um, to fall off to the side a little bit i think that's a little bit too big let's actually follow the contour perfectly and i think that's going to end up with the correct size yeah i think that's that's looking looking pretty good there yeah 
Uh, I think at this point we are pretty much done with the muscles. This has been an hour and a half. I think uh, relatively good speed. Not necessarily that much faster than um, some of the, you know, gesture drawing plus muscles efforts that I've done, but uh, I can be can be satisfied with it. And at this point, I usually like to do a sort of a, a in between inking, so to say. But I will start up a new layer and just, you know. Pencil ink everything. And check check how it looks. Uh, you know, with the with the mess here, with all the layers, it's it's difficult to see how things are actually looking. And when you With of you know test inking you will be able to see much more uh, really see how it looks like is it looking good is it looking bad is there something that you um, really do have to change there or is it more or less fine The knuckles are going to be up here. You might notice that I am slightly, I'm making slight changes at this point. This, um, in this case, I don't think I'm going to end up using this. Um, no. Layer as a, a, a final inks layer. But sometimes that uh, does happen to me. So I make it, turn it, take it in a little bit here. Hanging a bit here. Uh, I don't really make a, you know, conscious effort to add in the fat. So I add in the, you know, lack of um, definition at this stage. So I just uh, draw a lot more things that I am, then I am going to actually end up uh, inking here. There's a bit of the ass muscle going to be visible there. The tendon is going to be around here. It's going to be the uh, wing of the the edge of the um, hip is going to be much more visible on this side than it is on the other one. Here we are going to start getting into sort of a double curve. Should probably be uh, a bit more, you know, mass here on one side or the other. Probably, um, probably missing some mass on this side. Once I am done with this, um, you know, pseudo uh, ink layer, I will be able to use this uh, layer as, you know, guidelines for the uh, for the contour layers. So this is not just checking things. It's not. Um, 
wasted effort in that sense. I'm not going to make a huge effort to throw in the toes correctly since she is going to be wearing some sort of shoes anyway. Yes, uh, I think that's a bit too uh, big of a bicep there. So let's take it, uh, take it down a notch. Other than that, I think we are looking pretty good here. Seems proportional to me. Well, it should be proportional by this point when I have uh, drawn the exact same thing several times in varying uh, levels of detail. But it's always good to check one last time. Of course, dependent on what your desired level of um, of quality is. If you're just doodling around, you probably don't want to uh, go through this much effort. If we turn off the sketch, the bones and the muscles, yeah, looks fine to me. Then turn uh, some things back on. Uh, no, not this, not this group. That's not a useful one. I'm going to uh, let's call this take one. And they are going to have the ink there, and we are going to put in the the contours in this group as well. Now I am going to use uh, blue color for this. I don't know if there's particular reason to always use blue, or if it's just you know tradition from the back in the good old days from you know uh, blue ink. Um, Blueprints, cyan, cyan, cyanotype, the, the ink used for those, uh, or the process used for those actually used a, um, required the use of a blue blue color, since the, uh, because of the chemistry of it that I'm not really familiar with. But it's probably something that started back then. And might have some relevance for for today, but probably not. It's probably just tradition by this point. Here I am going to rate the um, back of the hand as a single plane. Of course, if you if you are lean, you are going to have this kind of um, hills there. I don't think that the scale of this drawing is going to be large enough to warrant that sort of you know, effort. That's going to be a fairly relevant plane, but uh, a lot of this is just going to be, you know, an area that's not necessarily all that um, detailed in the in the shadows.
Uh, that's too much. That's not going to be helpful. When you when you make this kind of um, assisting lines too messy, they don't work anymore. The point of it is to simplify. But it's easier to think about. If you just make a mess of it, it's just going to become more difficult for you to actually draw with it. And it would be to uh, you know pull it out of your ass. Of course, when you are good enough at drawing, you can just uh, pull almost anything out of your ass. But I am not. And uh, as I keep saying, if anyone in the audience is an actual professional artist, they probably are not watching me for top tips on this. So it's going to be good enough. So what do we have on the head here? Something like this. Some structure on the brow ridge. And then the temple here is basically one, one area. We have an area here. That uh, sometimes uh, reflects quite a lot more light than any other area in the in the face here. Then the uh, cheek muscle area is flat as well. The lips are going to be relatively detailed. That's a bit of a problem. The sides of the face here here are again going to be relatively helpful. I am going to abstract away most of the nose. And I am going to represent the lips as just, you know, three components on the top and two components on the bottom. Then we have goes back and then it goes forward again. This sort of detail that you generally, you know, for anime stylings, you, if you look at, you know, top level artists, uh, they will shade this kinds of contour information in, but they will uh, not point to it in the line art. So it's, it's not that, um, no. Uh, Japanese comic artists do not uh, think of the actual anatomy of the character as they are drawing it. They are stylizing a lot of it away and they are stylizing a lot of it away into the shading. Sort of similar to uh, for those of you who are Europeans or some sort of uh, maniacs who are Americans or non-Europeans or well Maniacs who are Americans or non-Europeans from countries where the uh, Disney comics are actually popular outside of Europe. I don't know if there are a lot of those. There might well be. Uh, Karl Barks was one of the you know, classic Disney comics artists from the uh, 50s, I think. 50s and 60s. And uh, an amazing artist. Had a way of abstracting an awful lot of things um, in a way that, particularly movement, like his uh, comics panels were extremely low on detail, but you could immediately tell what was happening. So the lack of Drawn detail is not an indication of um, lack of forethought or 
lack of uh, you know art quality if anything uh, i think it's probably a lot more admirable to be able to communicate that sort of um movement with an extremely small amount of lines than it is to uh, do it with a large amount of lines so uh, imagining that we would have someone who could communicate the uh, or suggest the amount of detail in for example uh, an Ilya Repin um, painting in let's say uh, an ink sketch I would be uh, extremely impressed by that Something like this. And then the planes of the foot. These are actually quite useful ones to draw even for, you know, just to have the volume of the foot more or less correct. Even if you aren't uh, going to be shading your you know, high effort shading your foot, you probably want to draw this kind of thing in anyway, just to make sure that you're, you know, doing a good job at it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a flat, flat spot here. And relatively aggressively falling away here. Something like this. I think that's uh, with that, I am about done. So, what do we have for the. The sun is on the left side here. I think I'm going to have to draw in the, the hat as well. Uh, maybe in a different, um, different ink layer. So it's going to be somewhere around there, not quite this. I want to have a dark red, I think. We want to have the flaps visible. And then we need the brim turned up. 
and I'm just going to you know obey my my sketch from before for the for the rest of it. It's going to be a bit um you know raised here to make um space for her hair. Oh the hair is also something that I have not um really got into yet. And I don't don't think I have the energy to do it today. We are getting into uh, close to four hours for the session for today. Well, we have the entire week. It might uh, mess with the the progression of this project um, or the progression of the uh, lessons in comparison with how far, far along the project is. But uh, it's not going to be much of a problem. That seems fine. The wind is blowing from the right, so it's going to be pushing it up on this side, and it's going to be pushing it up on this side. And here, where it is not being grabbed, it can just uh, flow naturally. So, I think that's going to be a relatively good first take ink for this. And now I am going to check what happens. It works more or less. Does it work down here? It does work down here. Does it work down here? Yes. I'm going to be able to get a relatively good, um, you know, first pass for the um, block uh, color blocking, and then I'm just going to, you know, which one is all. Alt is minus. So I don't want that. Uh, there's a hole somewhere here. So if I try to select. What did I try to select? Or did I just misclick? Well, who cares? Anyway, I am going to at least start on the uh, color blocking for this. Well. Uh, my idea was to have um, you know, clothing for tomorrow uh, and I might then make it, you know, color and hair, uh, clothes, clothes and hair and then um, I can draw in the hair here and then start actually uh, inking it. It's going to be fine. You know, some fixing here and there. This is mostly mostly fine. Not quite perfect. I imagine this is the kind of you know little uh, fixing fixing up thing that you would have to do um, if you were using the auto the automatic tools as well. There's some empty there. Some empty there and there. I'm going to turn the background a bit um, darker here so that, uh, you know, any missing missing areas are more aggressively visible here, hopefully. Hmm. There's a bit of a you know, missing, missing align art. Although I think that. The, I think this is more of um, a bit of a mistake than a mistake in the line art than missing line art. I think think the leg is probably going to end up being a bit thicker here.
I don't think that's... Uh, probably good enough for now. Which layer is this one? Is the ink? Ah, oh yeah. So I've got some, uh, you know, maybe a bit more. We'll put in the contours on top of maybe turn down the opacity. Turn up the opacity under here. You know, for the uh, for the thumbnail. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably enough for today. Save everything. Uh, I have not had any crash issues since Monday, so it seems like the reference docker was unfortunately uh, quite a crash problem when combined with uh, the version 5.0.0. Unfortunate, but... Uh, I guess you just have to live with it. So, this is going to be the end of the recording for today. Thank you to everyone watching After the Fact on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned something. And, most likely, see you in seconds in the next component.